I welcome you all to the first in a series of five webinars that will be focusing on best practices for closing the pandemic learning gap in Ohio schools. This webinar will focus on how our educators are dealing with the learning gap that's been created by the pandemic in our elementary schools. We have a great lineup of panelists and they will be addressing the issue during this hour long live webinar. My name is Jeff Good. I'm the Chief Education Technology Officer for PBS Western Reserve, and we are so fortunate to have received funding for this project through the Broadcast Educational Media Commission, as well as in collaboration with the Ohio Department of Education. All of our webinars, accompanying podcasts, and all the supportive resources can be found on our website that you should see during some of our graphics that along the bottom of our screen. We're live tonight on YouTube Live, and so if you're attending this live event, remotely and have any questions, feel free to drop them in the chat. Um, and I'll make sure that we get those to the panelists. So let's let's get started. So I'm happy to have such an educated and diverse group of panelists um, from very different walks of life, especially in the education field. However, you'll find that they all connect back to our issue of closing that post-pandemic learning gap as it relates to our elementary students. Our panelists consist of Vladimir Kogan is the associate professor in The Ohio State University's Department of Political Science, and by courtesy, the John Glenn College of Public Affairs. His research focuses on education governance and policy, and he has published more than 30 peer review studies in top political science, economics, and public policy journals. Kogan has also served on editorial boards of several academic journals. Vlad was the co-author of How the COVID-19 Pandemic Affected Student Learning in Ohio, an analysis of spring 2021 Ohio State Tests. That report was submitted to the Ohio Department of Education. Vlad's co-authored report will also be one of our deep dive podcasts that will accompany this webinar. Dennis Dunham is the superintendent at Letonia Exempted Village School located in Columbia County, Ohio. And for the past 41 years, Dennis has served as a teacher, a coach, a principal, and a superintendent. Prior to his position at Letonia, Dennis served as principal and superintendent at South Range Local Schools in Mahoning County, and as a teacher, coach, and principal at Southern Local Schools in Columbia County. To deal with Letonia's learning gap with their elementary students, Letonia conducted the Bear Care K-6 summer camp over this past summer, for students entering grades kindergarten through six. It included fun summer activities on and off campus with free breakfast and lunch, plus free transportation. Dennis will take an opportunity to highlight this program and its effect on Letonia's younger students. We're also fortunate that those efforts in Letonia will be a subject of another one of our Deeper Dive podcasts that will be created to support this webinar. Ashley Mariano is the Prevention Coordinator and Family Community Partnership Liaison at the Educational Service Center of Eastern Ohio. A graduate from Case Western Reserve University with a Master of Science in Social Administration, she is a licensed social worker. Her current work focuses on engaging that whole child framework, on supporting vulnerable student populations, and also in working to help create a, a more coordinated landscape of care at the school and community levels. Ashley is passionate about educator wellness and resilience and promoting best practice in prevention. Prior to this role supporting the district, Ashley worked locally as a pediatric social worker and mental health therapist. Ashley will be addressing how the ESC of Eastern Ohio works with districts from the ground up to bring the PACS good behavior game into elementary buildings as universal prevention efforts, um, as well as other efforts to equip and empower those elementary educators and leaders to support the whole child. Joni Jones is in her fifth year at Struthers Elementary School as assistant principal. Her philosophy is to always do what is best for kids, and in her 15 years of administration and 11 years of teaching, that passion has really led her decisions. Wanting the best for each child walking in through the door of Joni's buildings really helps keep Joni motivated to reflect and collaborate so that her elementary team can do more. Joni has a master's in administration and in early childhood education. 
Sarah Scowron has served students in the role of school psychologist for 10 years at Struthers City Schools, working with students ages 5 through 21. Sarah participates in the state support team region PBI, Region 5 PBIS Coaches Training Program. She has also attended two years of the Challenging Behaviors Professional Development Sessions that really develop educators' skills in implementing PBIS supports and systems into Struthers Elementary School when addressing behavioral needs. As a member of the Struthers Elementary School's leadership team, Sarah has developed and implemented building-wide plans to increase those social-emotional learning opportunities that support all students, increasing needs created by the disruption and isolation of the pandemic have really emphasized the importance of adults intentionally introducing and teaching pro-social behaviors and developing that emotional intelligence with students to help them reach their full potential at school. And last but not least, Sherry Bircham serves as the Director for the Office of Learning and Instructional Strategies for the Ohio Department of Education. In this role, Sherry oversees the development, the revision and implementation of the K-12 Ohio Learning Standards and Model Curriculum. Her office has also begun focusing on providing professional learning around implementation of the content standards. In addition, her office is beginning the work on supporting districts throughout Ohio in the review, in the selection, and the implementation of high quality instructional materials with the support of the CCSSO Instructional Materials Professional Development Network. So we've got a great group out there, but before we begin, let's take a closer look at this national issue of closing that learning gap that all schools across the country are continuing to wrestle with. Let's take a look with a news package from NBC News. Everybody had the rug pulled out from under them and we switched from sending our children to school to, oops, now parents have a lot more responsibility for their children's education. It was very difficult as a parent. I had three children online at one time. If they needed help, I wasn't available and they didn't have anybody else to turn to. You and your partners discussed. Now I teach third grade. The last time that they were actually in a normal school year, a full school year, was honestly kindergarten because their first grade year, they ended due to the pandemic. As we look across the country at different sources of data, all of them show that students are on average quite behind from where they would have been if they had been in school during that year. COVID really disrupted schooling across the nation. Many schools were closed, students didn't have access to classrooms, and some of them were able to get online, but many of them really just had some time when they had no um, access to formal schooling. And so the result of this is a lot of disrupted learning. She had lots of difficulties. She definitely regressed in a lot of her studies, especially writing and math. She um, was not interested in the school, in the school work. The biggest struggles that we had were just to find materials that were visually and motorically accessible for, for the content areas. part about the pandemic is, is the fact that it affected different students differently and that in many cases it exacerbated the real inequalities that we already have in our system in educational opportunities for students. Times one is... With Sam, we were very concerned about his progress in math because of who he is and the disabilities that he has. He was just excluded from a lot of classroom instruction in, in math. On Zern, it's like an actual teacher that was videoed giving the lesson. 
and it speaks to them and walks them through pieces of the problem and asks them questions. And that's what the kids need. Seeing a physical person there, it's like sitting with me at a small table. Um, the core of how we think about math is we show you math, we explore math together in a way that makes sense. You'll see a lot of pictures, a lot of real world objects, and a lot of ways of making math concrete. It's math so math makes sense. Online platforms really helped Abby by giving her lots of practice. It starts at a very basic level and moves up very simply. So I think lots of practice and just choosing which platform works best for her has helped her tremendously. CERN helps you with math and you go through like four stages and then if you complete those four stages, you can move on to the next lesson. Seven, one. To go from kindergarten level math to almost finishing up sixth grade level math. To know that he can do that, it's amazing. It has absolutely improved in math this year. Um, and I very rarely have to help her with the math homework anymore. And her scores are wonderful. Last year, I was very slow at it and like didn't really understand how to do math. But this year, I know how to divide and I know how to do multiplication and all different kind of math. It's intensive tutoring, tutoring that really creates a strong relationship between students and a tutor and an adult who, who knows them. Tutoring is a big piece of closing gaps. So I actually tutor twice a week with a group of kids to not only close gaps, but push them onto the next level if they're ready for it, even if it's above grade level. If a parent is noticing that their child is falling behind, they should just reach out to that student's teacher because that teacher has the ability to, to navigate their school and really find out what resources are available for the student. We're going to fill in those learning gaps as we go. It's going to be a long and steady process, but that's what our job is. We are educators and we are meant to provide for our students no matter what they need. I just know that they are going to be okay. So our first panelist is Vladimir Kogan from Ohio State University. Vlad co-authored the report, How the COVID-19 Pandemic Affected Student Learning in Ohio, an analysis of spring 2021 Ohio State tests, which was submitted to the Department of Education. Vlad, take a moment. I've heard great things about this report, and it's very telling, and it's a nice baseline as we talked a bit ago. Tell us about the report, how it originated, and some of the findings that those that are watching might find surprising. Well, thanks, Jeff, uh, for having me on and being part of this panel and the opportunity to, to summarize for you what we found. So this is joint work with my Ohio State colleague, Steph Stefan Levertu, um, that we did in collaboration with the Department of Education. Um, and early on in the pandemic, um, I think it became clear that um, that we really needed to track student outcomes. Um, and so, uh, you know, we, we um, in, in collaboration with the research director at ODE, um, came together and tried to figure out what was the best way to really do this. Um, so I should say at the outset that Ohio has really been a national leader in collecting and analyzing student data to understand how the pandemic has affected young people. Um, last spring, I know some powerful interest groups here in the state tried to use the crisis as an opportunity to kill state testing. In fact, there was one state legislator who said, um, quote, we know that students are fell behind. We don't need state tests to tell us that. But what I hope to convince you tonight is actually the tests tell us a lot more than that. Um, they show us which student subgroups have been most impacted and whether students began to recover or fell more behind once schools reopened and the impact that different methods of instruction had on their learning. And I want to, before I get into the report, I want to really recognize um, the leadership of former State Superintendent DeMaria, um, Governor DeWine, and State Senate President Huffman, who really stood up for Ohio students last spring and insisted that we track how they were doing despite strong political pushback against doing so. So overall, um, the numbers are truly terrifying. Um, our best estimate is that Ohio students were between one third and one half of a year behind in English language arts last spring, compared to their expected achievement prior to the pandemic. Um, in math, students were between one half to a whole year behind. And to put these disruptions into perspective, um, they represent an eight percentage point decrease in the proportion of students who achieved grade level proficiency in English language arts and a 15% decrease in math proficiency. So in English language arts, we found that historically disadvantaged groups saw particularly large declines in their achievement. 
And this was true by every definition of a disadvantage we examined, whether student race, socioeconomic status, um, qualification for special education services, and whether students were non-native English speakers. And we saw considerably larger learning losses at Ohio's urban school districts compared to their rural and suburban counterparts. By contrast, uh, the declines in math were consistently large um, and roughly of similar magnitude across all student subgroups and districts. We also found important differences by mode of learning, with students who had greater access to in-person learning during the pandemic seeing smaller achievement impacts, although the differences were more pronounced in English language arts than for math. In fact, for third grade language arts, language arts we found that students learned about one third less um, each week they spent in virtual learning compared to their peers who attended school in person during the same time. Using the best estimates we can find, the test score declines I just described will depress the lifetime income of Ohio students by 3% if left unaddressed. The impact on the state economy as a whole is even larger, corresponding to a 6% decrease in future Ohio GDP. So in current dollars, that amounts to more than $1.5 trillion. An important question to ask is how much of these declines were caused by the school closures initially in spring of 2020? And relatedly, did students start to make up lost ground once they were back in school last fall? Uh, the short answer, the pressing answer is no. Um, the best evidence we have suggests the students actually continued to fall behind even once school resumed after the initial closures. In fact, we estimate that about one third of the overall learning losses since the start of the pandemic were due to less than expected learning after schools reopened in fall of 2020. And we know that these disruptions are continuing to this day. Um, at the start of this year, many students were missing class because of aggressive quarantine requirements in some districts. And now during the Omicron wave, we have districts and schools being disrupted by mass teacher and student absences. Um, the video you just showed uh, mentioned the company Zern that has a web product uh, for math. And they just put out a report last week showing that um, once again, low income students are logging in and making less progress um, as, as, really as late as December of 2021. So to be absolutely blunt, um, Ohio is really facing an academic emergency. We need an all hands on deck approach. Just as we have worked hard to protect our healthcare system from collapse, we need to do everything we can to keep schools open. And there are even more practical reasons, I think, for prioritizing schools at this point. Because today's students will be tomorrow's epidemiologists, tomorrow's vaccine scientists, and tomorrow's healthcare workers. So continuing to allow education to be disrupted today will make us less prepared for the pandemics of tomorrow, when we'll need the same skilled workforce to keep society running. Thank you. Vlad, thank you so much. And as we as we look at that report, and I'll just, uh, we've got a little bit of time left here, is if you could summarize in, um, if you could use the word optimism, can you use the term optimism when we think about what is happening uh, in the future as far as how schools are handling this learning loss? Gosh, yeah. You know, I, I guess, uh, you know, I, I'm usually a very optimistic person, but uh, here, you know, I, I'm, I'm going to take the side of pessimism. I would say for two reasons. One, um, you know, I think it would be one thing if um, after after schools reopened, we, we saw kind of um, a trend toward accelerated learning towards making up lost ground. And again, from, from what we've seen so far, we, we're just not seeing that, right? So, so we're not where we need to be in, in really um, getting back on track. And I think it's going to be hard. So, you know, the, the impacts that I just described to you, um, if you look at education policy research, um, everything we know, there just does not exist a policy intervention that is proven at scale to close learning gaps of that size. Um, we just have nothing like that. I mean, aside from really high intensity dosage uh, tutoring, um, that's really the only intervention that comes close. Um, and I think we have seen, um, just to be frank, uh, really pushback against some interventions that we really need. So for example, one thing we could be doing is extending learning time, whether that's extended learning time during the day, or whether that's extending the school year into the summer. And I have not seen any school districts propose that, um, although that is you know, low hanging fruit that we know works. Um, so if we're not taking advantage of those opportunities, if we're not doing those things, I, I think it's hard for me to be optimistic that, that, that you know, we're, we're really on track to get the students back to where they would have been in the absence of the pandemic. Thank you, Vlad. Hopefully, if we if you stay around for the rest of the webinar with all of these folks that are here, I think maybe we'll bring some optimism your way because there really are some dynamic programs that many of the folks that are part of our panel are are uh, integrating. So uh, hopefully that that will make you a little more optimistic. Thank you so much for your time, Vlad. Um, great information. Um, and as I said earlier, Vlad's report will be a subject of one of our deep dive podcasts that will accompany this webinar on our project website. Once again, thank you, Vlad. Our next panelist is Dennis Dunham, and he is a superintendent at Letonia EV Schools. Letonia took addressed that whole learning gap idea with their elementary students by 
operating what they called the Bear Care Summer Program. So Dennis, I had an opportunity to read about the camp in an article from the Lisbon Morning Journal. Give me an idea kind of how this idea of a camp got started. Um, what were some of the elements along the way uh, that were part of the camp? And, and what were some of the things that Letonia uh, kind of uh, learned about along the way? Hey, great. Good evening, everyone. Uh, to start with, I, I really felt, you know, this is obviously it's our second year of a pandemic and going back, clear back to June or July of 21, it feels like it's been an eternity ago. But to give you an idea, we just felt that kids have lost um, have lost more than just academics. They've lost, you know, part of their, their childhood, their, their uh, you know, early years, our kindergartner, kindergartners, to give you an idea, as they came in their um, until our summer uh, learning camp, our bear care camp, uh, many were remote. They had not uh, been given the opportunity to really interact with one another. So up until June, July of, of 21, we had some students that uh, uh, were, were being taught remotely, uh, very little interaction with one another. Um, one of the things I, I really talk about here at Letonia is creating a culture of respect and belief and we also talk about developmental assets and, you know, uh, internal assets and external assets and uh, what we need to do to move kids along. So it was a natural fit for us to, to look at a, a K-6 and a 712 summer learning series. And we were very careful not to call it summer school. You can imagine after what the kids have been through to think that this is going to be a, a school as they, they recall it, remote learning and and trying to catch up. This was uh, something that we really felt that needed to be a lot of fun for kids. Uh, we wanted to make it fun, but at the same time, uh, give kids an opportunity to to uh, to work on the learning loss that we know is, has been evident for, for all districts. We had uh, so many activities from the start of school, from Halloween to Thanksgiving, to Christmas, to Easter that were canceled or postponed. And we're just trying to give kids uh, some of their childhood back. And oh, by the way, we were able to, to teach some academics, work on the social emotional side and, and give kids uh, a good reason to be back in school where it was fun. Uh, students were not anxious. And a lot of the, the unintended consequences, things that really we learned from this, uh, of course, we're planning for next year already, but we had an opportunity to to get to know kids in a different way. They get to know, our teachers got to know kids in a different way, and our students were able to, to get to know teachers in a different way via field trips, via some special classes of, maybe it's home act, home act or art or gym class or uh, just walks on the school campus. And some of the pictures that Mr. Good was uh, was posting are just in our, in our, uh, our village. We also had some opportunities to go to uh, some neighboring farms and things that you just didn't have time to do during the school day. Now, it's funny, Dennis, you had mentioned um, the whole concept of the camp. Through the eyes of the students, what was what was a typical day of, of bear care? So they would be, the first thing they do, just like now, they would come in and we'd serve breakfast to the students and really relaxed atmosphere in our cafeteria. And we had students that were perhaps six, seven-year-olds interacting with eight or nine-year-olds and vice versa, bigger brothers, bigger sisters that you normally don't have an opportunity to do. And you can see a picture of, of I'm not sure where they were there, but one of the, the local restaurants, but uh, they didn't have those opportunities before because let's face it, during a school year, kindergarten or first grade stay with one another, second or third grade. But a typical day they come in, they have breakfast, um, they would go to learning centers throughout the throughout the morning. So 8:30 to 12:30, four hours was would just fly by, but four hours is also uh, ample time to get some things done. So we uh, a lot of a lot of time where kids could get out and play, but also our main focus was math and ELA, and we were able to accomplish that. Now, when you talk about your existing staff, um, you obviously had your staff there, uh, several of your of your teachers there, um, when you talked about they were playing, but you're also focusing on subjects. What were some of the 
you know, your your staff that was there? What were yeah. what were some of the options they we, gave there? We were really cognizant of, let's face it, all of the educators, all of our educators across the state and across the country were just absolutely exhausted by, by the time June got here. So we tried to go and look at a rotation where we'd have some of our regular classroom teachers, grades K through six, um, and, and these were paid positions. We would provide uh, one week on, two weeks off, maybe two out of the four weeks they would, we would, they would come in, or maybe on one, Monday, Wednesday, Thursday. We gave them an opportunity to interact with the kids. Uh, and again, everyone has some areas they feel more comfortable with, whether it was math or, or ELA or science, or uh, we had home ec teachers from the, from the high school coming in. Uh, we had our art teachers, we had phys ed. Uh, other special classes. We had some language uh, classes at times for our younger kids. So everyone seemed to, to pull together. Um, and, and I heard this before, and I, I can't emphasize enough. We just felt so badly about what happened. The rug had been pulled out from our kids, and we were just trying to give them an opportunity to put that uh, rug back under their feet with some good, fit, good footing where they could move forward and be successful and be ready for the start of the 21, 22 school year. And two months is significant time that we just didn't have in the past. So our, our K through five, K through six, I really believe, and we had at times 75 to 80 students and we're a small district with class sizes ranging, you know, a class graduating classes of 50, 55 students. So it was a nice turnout. And I think this is something that will continue uh, well past the pandemic, in my estimation. Then, as you mentioned, and I'll, I'll wrap it up with this, what were some unexpected, you mentioned one to me, what were some unexpected consequences you had of this, this uh, summer program? Again, teachers getting to know kids in a different way, uh, and, and, and also parents coming in, they had the opportunity to see, that was going, see what was going on. It still comes back to building relationships the developmental assets that we talk about here at Letonia on a daily basis and creating a culture that our kids can be successful. But we, you know, as far as unintended consequences, I would say that relationship building that we were able to develop during some, uh, summer series session one and the second series uh, in July. So we couldn't have been more pleased with it. And I think it's just going to get big, bigger and better as we go through. I don't want to. I don't want to leave you yet till one of the unexpected consequences you told me about that I laughed when was, what was it like with the with the students coming back to school in September? Well, the students' routines, right? Um, you know, if you think about the uh, let's use a five year old coming in for the first time in in kindergarten. There's how many weeks, and we have some elementary staff members here. How many weeks does it take for them to acclimate themselves to to school and being away from parents or brothers? and sisters. So routines were established. Kids really knew the, where they needed to go. They didn't have to worry about where is this classroom. They, they had the run of the K-12. So they had an opportunity to really get to know the school, the facility, the staff, secretarial, and even me. So it, it was a good opportunity for me to interact with the kids. And I had an opportunity where normally there's three months of, there's a lot going on in the summer for admin, but you rarely see teachers doing what they were doing. So I had an opportunity to get to know, know kids better and staff and vice versa. Dennis, thank you so much. Um, really appreciate that's an exciting program. Um, one of the things that we will be featuring in one of our Deeper Dive podcasts uh, will be a conversation with Dennis, a uh, further conversation with Dennis about that program. Um, our next panelist is Ashley Mariano uh, from the ESC of Eastern Ohio. If you're not familiar with the ESC of Eastern Ohio, they are formerly the Mahoney County ESC. So Ashley, I kind of know that the ESC of Eastern Ohio, they've, you, as you referenced it, they've implemented PACS, the Good Behavior Game. So take a moment to kind of explain that, that game and how the ESC went about kind of working on that approach and, and what have you found out from that implementation? I would love to, Jeff, and I hope that I can offer some optimism around this topic of learning loss. But to do that, I want to rewind the clock a little bit. So in August of 2020, Penn State released a research brief that really highlighted 
we're at a critical time around supporting wellness and social emotional learning as a key to supporting academic success. So I wanna talk about social emotional learning for a second. And SEL, social emotional learning by definition, is the modeling and teaching of interrelated sets of cognitive, affective, and behavioral competencies that are really going to underscore an individual's capacity to learn, to develop, and to have those mutually supportive relationships throughout their life. And that definition comes from CASEL, which is the Collaborative for Academic and Social Emotional Learning. So we're really in a space to move from reaction to prevention as we integrate social and emotional supports into our districts. We know that in these little elementary students, stressed brains cannot learn and that dysregulated emotions make that engagement and learning even more difficult. So this is where some really unique and evidence-based opportunities came in at the perfect time. So the work that I do, I have the ability to engage with our local school districts to really complement Ohio's strategic plan for education, which is each child our future. And that really emphasizes the importance of meeting the needs of the whole child. So when I think learning loss, I don't just think academic, I think social and emotional and physical and intellectual. And we really wanna make sure that our students are challenged and prepared and empowered for their future. So pre-COVID, uh, the state of Ohio believes so strongly in this initiative that they had $20 million allocated to focus on prevention initiatives, K-12. And in our elementary buildings, uh, this looks like PAC's good behavior game. So Mahoning County's funding got seated with our Mental Health and Recovery Board, and it was really leveraged by leadership at the board, leadership at the Educational Service Center, and all of the area superintendents pre-COVID uh, to say, what can we do with this funding? And they opted to support evidence-based prevention programming. And PAC's good behavior game was a great fit. So PACS is this word that means peace, productivity, health, and happiness. And when you consider CASEL's components of social emotional learning, we have that match in PACS. So it is universal prevention for all students and has decades of research that support when the good behavior game is implemented with fidelity, students have increased protective factors. So things like their self-regulation skills, their positive peer and adult relationships, as well as this great opportunity to mitigate risk factors. So we see things as they grow up, like substance use, mental health issues, and school discipline concerns all decrease. So I was happy to get to act kind of as a project manager for this endeavor to help engage and create an implementation plan for districts who are looking to champion this work. So currently we have half a dozen districts in Mahoning County engaged in the work of PAC's Good Behavior Game, which is well over six elementary school buildings. And we have several more districts looking to implement PACs over the 22-23 school year. And I just want to mention an Ed Source article that came out last spring. It really captures what I think is the heart of this learning loss matter. It said the best way schools can help students catch up academically after all of this learning disruption and distance is to make sure that they feel relaxed and safe and connected to their friends and to their teachers and to their classrooms. So I really stand on what research has to say about best practice. Um, and we know that there's this direct link between mental health and academic performance. So we know as educational professionals that gaps in achievement already existed prior to COVID. That package that you played um, at the beginning from NBC highlighted this, right? That there were subgroups of students who already had large gaps, COVID only, it made these gaps wider. So we know that we want our young students to achieve, to, to meet the third grade reading guarantee and to be successful on state testing levels. But to get there, we need them feeling connected to each other and to their schools. So as an educational service center, we're not only leveraging this support for PACS Good Behavior Game in the classroom of our schools, but we look to other ways of support. We have um, book studies and adult learning communities. We've curated special professional development around not only student social and emotional learning, but adults as well. So we wanna look at the whole child when we're addressing these learning loss supports. 
Ashley, a whole lot of stuff there, and I really appreciate uh, your information. You've covered it all, talked about the services that the ESCs provide to our districts. Certainly appreciate your time um, on this webinar. It sounds like you're very busy, and uh, we certainly appreciate. We're, we're hoping by the end of this, Vlad, we'll be very optimistic about, about what the potential is. So once again, I thank you so much. Thank um, you. We're going to move right on now to our next panelist, which is Joni Jones. Um, she is assistant principal at Struthers Elementary. So, Joni, as you as you hear what folks are talking about and and Vlad's um, report, what are some approaches that you're part of at at Struthers Elementary that begin to address this learning gap issue with your students? Well, we've always been interested in the test scores and. Um, you know, analyzing that data, I understand the report. And we knew one year, as um, Dennis referred to, our children were denied a lot in their childhood. And we had one year that we were um, in school almost every day, other than, you know, a few snow days. And um, that was coming back from the pandemic. And we saw so many gaps, not only with their learning, but with their social emotional um, aspects. They didn't, we kept them um, behind little partitions. We wanted to keep the germs away from the kids. You know, they were masked up and, and it just what didn't feel like, um, kids should be. So this year, as we anticipated a new year, we were excited about a new year a newness, but in preparation for this year, last year, the County rolled out, um, the PACS program, and I am in charge of a lot of the discipline in um, in a school, being the assistant uh, principal role. Mm -hmm. And when you see the behaviors that um, our children were starting to exhibit last year at the um, end of last year, they were starting to get a little bit more fidgety because they had been boxed up for so long. And a part of our PBIS plan was always about the positive behavior um, interventions and supports. And so when I found out that our superintendent signed on between um, you know the the partnership with the ESC that we are so fond of, that uh, we would be able to get PACs um, as part of this grant. I was so excited because I said, please, I hope you signed this for this grant PACs. This has been a research-based program that we wanted for um, quite a while. And so we trained our staff. Everybody was trained last year in the spring in anticipation for starting the year, starting the ground running. And I, um, you know, we, went, we, we started with the kernels and the education for PACs and getting to the good behavior game is where we are now and playing that game. So uh, just to some kudos to Ashley Mariano and everything that she's done for us. She has volunteered to come and meet with our teachers as a PACs partner. Uh, she's a trained by PACs with the tier one for the universal tier. That is the, the kernels that we teach the kids in order to play the game. We have the PACs heroes that she's allowed our district to actually take part in, which is for tier two kids. And then the PACs partnering is her coaching ability to come into our district and help us implement this wonderful program that is research-based and has so much to give to our kids. So as we're rolling this out and that positiveness and kids believing in themselves, it has helped us with the academic engagement. So that's always the thing. It goes hand in hand. You can't leave the academics out of the social emotional or the social emotional out of the academics. So um, we are quite excited to be able to, to roll that out this year. Joni, as you look at um, the last couple years and what you've dealt with, what are some other um, initiatives that might be there on the horizon that that you're thinking about or integrating with your staff there at Struthers? Well, um, it has to be more of, of the, the group stuff. And what we, um, you know, as you see the kids working together in tandem and then whether it be the tutoring and, you know, when... Um, the, the research that was shared at first, as far as we don't have anything, we don't have anything else in our arsenal, but that tutoring and that small group thing, it's all about building those relationships. So as we do this, our teachers are building the relationships 
stronger with each other, leaning on each other more for support. And then those kids building the relationships. We will look to extend our summer school program and not call it summer school um, and our uh, after school tutoring as well. So those are the things that we have done, but a different focus on those. We have um, great partnerships with United Way that offer some things. But again, it's working on that relationship building and helping our parents too. Um, you know, with the ESC partnership, we've been able to offer parent nights for our parents uh, to help them in their role of helping their kids keep that low emotional response when they're responding to the children to help correct the behaviors so that they can help them learn better. So I think that, um, you know, those are the things that we want to continue to work with. Um, it was, it was a great result with parents wanting that. So, Joni, thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate your input. We're so excited about the opportunities that that you're working with and you're assisting your students there as assistant principal there at, at Struthers Elementary. Thank you so much for your time this evening. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Jeff. Um, let's take a quick little break here. You know, it's interesting when we watch this next video because it, it really focuses on elementary students that are ready to make that step from the elementary classroom into middle school. So let's take a closer look. School board. I talked with the district about its ideas and which students may be involved. Chad D'Angelo teaches biology. Science can be difficult, no matter the grade level. And then above that are going to be your herbivores. D'Angelo believes COVID created different ranges of learning, even affected by the different technologies used during learning last year. Uh, we definitely are seeing a little bit of a gap this year, um, especially with concepts that maybe should have been reviewed in previous years. Boardman is noticing more students return to class each week. Many buildings now have 80% of the students back in person. Boardman will use a two-step approach to close the learning gap. The first step is identifying students which need extra help. We're actually using um, benchmarking uh, of our students to see where they're at. We're using data to determine if they're on grade level or if they're behind. Boardman has been communicating with parents to let them know where their child is academically and where they need to be. It will add summer school into all buildings and encourage some students to attend. Oh, I think it's a phenomenal idea, especially in some of the, some of the subjects like math and English, where it's kind of a cumulative of, of knowledge, you know, grade level by grade level. Boardman may also use study tables and tutoring during the last nine weeks of school to help students. It will add some teachers to handle the summer work, plus provide breakfast, lunch, and transportation. It will fit within the budget because the district can use CARES Act money to pay for it. All supported 100% by CARES money. So you may see, well, we're adding three or four teachers, but we're adding them for one year, and it's absolutely no uh, cost uh, to our community. And I think that's very important. A second step of this plan is hiring counselors to beef up social and emotional. That video really has a gives you an overview of another local program that's dealing with the um, with the gap, the, the achievement gap there. The the so let's take a closer look now. And our next panelist is going to be Sarah Scowin and Scowin, and she is the school psychologist at Struthers City Schools, and she's been there for ten years. Sarah and I think Joni talked about it a little bit too. Uh, you mentioned to uh, to me some tier two and tier three approaches that you're using in your school. Can you explain, uh, kind of expand upon that and explain how Struthers' approach is with this uh, working with this learning gap? Sarah, your mic is muted. All good. You said some wonderful things. Sorry there you go. <laughs> so Struthers began about four years ago, um, really transitioning to that PBIS mindset and building the framework for student success through social emotional learning. So we had that opportunity to build that framework prior to the pandemic. And we know that student success comes from setting those clear expectations and having those consist that consistency. And with the pandemic, that consistency was really taken away from our students and expectations weren't able to be taught how we wanted them to be. And so when that learning environment is 
perceived to be maybe less safe or students are more stressed or not comfortable, we see those lower levels of achievement and then students don't learn to their best ability. So prior to going to a tier two support, we had to build that basis of having a matrix and looking at what our building expectations are. So as a team, we looked at every area of the building. We looked at the cafeteria, we looked at the classrooms, we looked at hallways, um, we looked at every single part of a student's day and then decided how we want those expectations to be taught. So we're all using the same lingo with our students. So from there, we have lesson plans and we teach those lesson plans and, and have those students understand and know what they're expected to behave what their expected behaviors are to be. Then you move up the levels. So the tier two supports that we have used are uh, what we call our problem solving team. And the problem solving team is still new to us and it's still developing, but the basis of the team is to give teachers the tools that they need to understand how to address these challenging behaviors in the classroom with the, a collaborative consultation framework. So teachers come with students, and as a team, you know, we have intervention specialists, we have classroom teachers, administration, guidance, counselors, all collaborating and giving those teachers supports that they need to be able to go back to the classroom and really determine what they need to do for their students. Um, other things that we have done in our district were social skills groups, and we have done things like check, in, check and connect where teachers, you know, check in in the mornings with students, check in at the end of the day. And then we also do behavior contracts. And I personally like behavior contracts because they're done with the students and it gives them a sense of um, participation that you know I can do this or it builds their confidence um, and then in turn works on building their academics. Um, the last step is our tier three approach. And that's where we really dive into specific student needs, um, doing those functional behavioral assessments on students, looking at the ABCs of behaviors so the antecedents, the behavior and the consequence of student behaviors. In order for us to change a behavior, we need to be able to figure out why the behavior is occurring. So that's what those functional behavior assessments really look at, pinpointing those areas, targeting behaviors. And then also, it's also important to keep in mind is what do we want to see from the student and what are we going to teach the student a replacement behavior in order for them to gain success in the classroom. Um, and like as a result of the pandemic this school year, we've seen that increase in the detrimental behaviors that have developed from the lack of structure and the positive climate in our schools for our students. And these behaviors really have increased our needs in our building for those tier two and those tier three supports. Um, and for those students, what I feel is very important is for them to be able to relearn those expectations to, so that they can build those positive relationships with their teachers and their peers, and so they can feel more successful in the classroom. One word that I think you sent my way was the word consistency. How does that come into play? Well, consistency and how um, our teachers and our any person in the building that comes across a student, like our paraprofessionals, we, we always make sure that our paraprofessionals are using the same procedures that we would expect our teachers to. Um, we teach our bus drivers to be able to implement some of these same strategies. Um, they've actually gone through the PACS training, or part of the PACS training actually has come and talked to our bus drivers so that we're all on the same page and that we all have the same mindset going forward and so that the students aren't confused because if they're confused, they're not gonna know how to behave. And then the other thing that, that you mentioned to me was that the term, and I love this term, being proactive instead of reactive. How does that fit in with, with your plan? So for our students, being proactive is that we look at the environment in which they're learning. So are there things that we're doing as educators that might be impacting their behaviors? So um, we dive deeper in, and that goes back to the why of a behavior, so the function of the behavior. So do we, is there something that we need to change to be able to um, make things a little bit um, more conducive environment for them? The other thing is 
being able to reinforce those behaviors that we expect or that we want to see more frequently. So we're using those positive language, that positive language with the students. We're pre-teaching skills. Um, we're, we're allowing them to understand before something happens what is expected of them. Ashley, thank you so much. Uh, really appreciate, I'm sorry, Sarah. Uh, really appreciate the, the input that you've given and what you're doing there at Struthers. Um, it, we had talked about this when this all started and between what Joni was talking about and Ashley and Sarah, it kind of intermixes there. And it's so great to see all of you working together for a common goal of, of kind of uh, decreasing that, that learning gap. So thank you so much for your time. Our final panelist um, is Sherry Bircham. And Sherry is the director of the Office of Learning and Instructional Strategies for the Ohio Department of Education. You know, I'm sure you've, Sherry, I'm sure you've listened with interest at all the work that uh, mm -hmm. our districts are doing in hopes of lessening um, that uh, elementary learning gap. However, you continue to do this work at ODE that includes some wonderful partnerships, some professional learning opportunities that really our districts would could really add to the as additional tools to their toolbox, right? So can you elaborate on, on those? Absolutely. And thank you, Jeff, for allowing me to be here tonight. Um, just as you said, I learned just as much from being here, you know, and, and hearing from the district stories as I do just interacting with everybody. So thank you for that opportunity. You know, on March 13th, 2020, we entered a time that our schools and districts had not experienced before. Students throughout Ohio were sent home and instruction shifted to that remote environment. And it did not take long for the department to hear the need from the education community that there was a need for support for educators, parents, district leaders, and ultimately Ohio's students. So, you know, coming together, we look at that data and to help, we sought the help of our partners to address those needs. Looking at it at a statewide scale, we really do rely on our partners. And those partnerships and collaborative efforts were formed through the pandemic and are still being formed with the help of the elementary and secondary school emergency relief funds that you've heard referenced a couple of times throughout tonight. Um, to do this, you know, uh, the department really um, focused on our three core principles of each child, our future, and that's equity, partnerships, and quality schools. And equity's focus is on Ohio's commitment to creating the learning conditions that ensure each child and every child acquires the knowledge and skills to be successful. And all of these opportunities you've heard from tonight focus on that equity, that equitable um, access to instruction. And then partnerships, partnerships, um, everyone's not just in those schools. At, excuse me, everyone, not just the schools, share the responsibilities of preparing children for su successful futures. And you heard that again tonight through those education service centers and the different schools and the different programs. And finally, our goal are quality schools. And a quality school is a place where parents, caregivers, community partners, and others interact for the benefit of students. So one of the um, exciting partnerships that we've just announced is a partnership with the Leading Men um, organization in the Cincinnati area. And that's through the support of the Literacy Lab, which is a national nonprofit organization. The Leading Men Fellowship currently operates in Baltimore, uh, Central Virginia, Milwaukee, and Washington, DC. And for the school year 2022-23, they are expanding into Cincinnati, Atlanta, and Phoenix. So what this is, is more than 100 men of color will be recruited for this $4.6 million initiative that um, strengthens preschool literacy program to serve pre-K students in the greater Cincinnati area. The leading men fellows are young men of color who have recently graduated high school and participate in a year long residency style experience in which they provide evidence based literacy support to those pre K students, while they also in turn receive coaching and professional development and gain that valuable experience. So over a period of three years, they will be at 100 fellows in the greater Cincinnati schools working with our pre K students. So that's very exciting. Go ahead, Jeff. So sh talk to us a little bit about the, I, 
I'm I'm always a, I'm a big Kosai fan. So mm-hmm. talk to us a little bit about the Learning Lunchboxes that the program that you work with. We have a, a graphic of a web page where you talk <laughs> about it, but but how does that all work in with with those plan that to uh, to kind of make that gap a little smaller? Yes, very important. So when we think about our instruction, and you heard some of the speakers mention this, it's very important that it's high quality, that it's tier one, and that it's it's scaffolded to meet the needs of the students because we we know that there are learning gaps. Um, the COSI Learning Lunchboxes, we've been a partner with COSI for a long time, and the Learning Lunchboxes were actually in existence prior to the pandemic. Um, and they, they started as an opportunity to reinforce that science is for everyone. And they put engaging STEM activities into this little kit and they served them with a meal for the underserved communities. Well, once the pandemic hit, they said, wait a second, this is an opportunity to provide instruction at home and support families in instruction so that it's engaging and it's not just on the computer or paper pen packet. And so they were designed to encourage families to work together to investigate a phenomenon in our world related to water, nature, space, or energy. And COSI partnered with our Department of Education to ensure that those kits were aligned to Ohio's learning standards, which was so very important for our teachers because then the students can go back into the classroom and pick up their learning and actually have enriched learning aligned to Ohio's learning standards. Sounds like an exciting program, but you know another yeah. another collaborative partner that we work with as an Ohio ed tech agency is is Info Ohio, and I see uh, they seem to be a very strong partner in in helping lessen that that learning gap. Um, yes. How do they fit in? Let me tell you, Info Ohio has been an amazing support, and if parents and educators and students do not know about Info Ohio, you really need to listen up. It is Ohio's pre K digital library. And they're just from the funding from the ESSER funds, they were able to curate over 80,000 free digital resources, free digital resources for students, educators, and families that have been used in over 86 counties, 44 states, and 26 countries. So not just Ohio. So we've we've been able to benefit you know, nationwide and actually I believe internationally. Um, but specifically for the pandemic, um, through the partnership with the department and Info Ohio, we were able to provide funds and they were able to secure subscriptions to um, Science Online, Today's Science, The World Almanac, Storia, Pebble Go Next, and Capstone Interactive eBooks. All of those are free online reading materials for students and teachers to use. Parents can use them. And they are books that you would go and buy from your local bookstore. So it's amazing access. If you've not checked out Info Ohio, you really need to. And last week, I know you didn't want to touch on it, but I'm going to make you touch on it anyway. We talk about professional learning. And obviously, you're doing some things in literacy and math and remote and blended instruction. Um, And how does that all fit in with with helping uh, reduce that learning gap? Well, thank you for asking, because since we have time, I will touch on it. Um, Our office put on a Building Bridges Professional Learning Opportunity, and our um, Office of Approaches to Teaching and Professional Learning also did a literacy conference live. All of that is free professional learning for our educators in Ohio. And actually, some of the sessions were geared towards parents, guidance counselors, other stakeholders um, that we would like to reach. So those are virtual online professional learning um, sessions and can be watched at any time. They're available on Ohio Department of Education's website and they touch on high quality instructional materials, high quality professional learning, literacy, math efforts, and then also remote and blended instruction strategies. Well, I'm so glad that we brought, I feel like the end of a Carol Burnett show. I'm glad we brought everyone here together um, it's been a wonderful webinar for our first um, time of doing this. It's it's an interesting subject that we're working on. It's not going to go away. So appreciate everyone's time again uh, for attending our first session in this series of re- uh, webinars that begin to focus on these be- best practices and closing that pandemic learning gap in our schools. We truly appreciate all the input from our panel. This webinar will be part of the resources available on our project website with the URL that during the process you saw at the bottom of your screen. Um, We will also be creating a series of podcasts that will support each of these webinars. 
Um, and they will also take a deeper dive into a subject that, just like tonight, you'd love to learn a little bit more. So those podcasts will also be available on our project website. Just to put it on your calendar, our next webinar, which will focus on the work of our middle schools uh, to combat this learning gap, uh, will take place on Wednesday, February 23rd from 6 to 7 p.m. Join us then. From the staff of PBS Western Reserve, we thank you for your time and viewing this evening, and we hope to see you in February. Have a great night, everyone.